thanks so much again, Jennifer. Um, thanks everyone for coming back. This is gonna be uh, quick. Uh, we have 45 minutes to round this up, so um, hang in there and, uh, and uh, um, I'm, I'm just gonna uh, get started straight away. Uh, what we plan to do, like the whole point of today is uh, partly to come up with some ideas for uh, practical solutions for the issues we're face, uh, facing in uh, our uh, working environment, working <coughs> with pictures, with video photography. So um, what we do for start, this um, is that we're, we've got somebody new here uh, on stage uh, and all the other people uh, you already know, So, but I'm still do a quick uh, introduction. So um, we have Anahita, uh, who's been a journalist for many, many, many years, and who is the editor of the uh, uh, Himmel South Asian. Um, we have Eric Wissert, already introduced just now by um, Jennifer, also tens of years of experience in the field. Uh, David Campbell from the World Press Photo, uh, one of the organizers of today, together with Rights Exposure, where Robert Godden is uh, the co-founder and director and then uh, again, I think we should stress that this has been kindly co-organized by HKU, Jennifer Wong and uh, her team. So um, Eric is here new and the reason is that we've been talking a lot about like what happens in the field, like in the practice of actually selecting, publishing and uh, putting out pictures. And uh, one of the big players in this world is Agence France Presse, uh, a big wire agency and Eric uh, has been uh, one of the people that put together their uh, most recent code of ethics in 2016. And so we've invited him to uh, give us some insights into that. Get there. No problem. So I uh, I just recently uh, uh, started working at the <coughs> South China Morning Post as their uh, senior uh, video producer, and next week I have a two-hour code of ethics workshop. So I don't know yet what it's going to be, but I thought it was quite nice to be working for. A <laughs> so I'm uh, I'm looking forward to that. Okay, good to go. Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, well done staying till the end. Thanks for staying to listen to the last uh, panel. So um, it took me about a year to do this code of ethics. So I'm, and I've got 10 minutes and then the gong goes. So I'm, I'm going to have to be fairly quick. So anyway, I wouldn't give you the history of AFP, but just roughly we've got about more than 1,500 journalists worldwide. Uh, Paris is the world headquarters. Hong Kong is the uh, regional headquarters for Asia Pacific. And, um, okay, how do I go back? No, okay. So in uh, 2015, I was asked um, to draw up a new code of ethics for AFP. We had a uh, sort of 20 ethical principles included in our style book, but um, I mean, it was out of date and had been obviously overtaken by the whole digital era. So, um, so how do you write a code of ethics? Um, what I did was I went online, as one does, and I went through. I found as many ethical codes as I could worldwide. Reuters, AP, BBC, which is like, I mean, it's got the longest code of ethics you'll ever see in your life. Asian ones where I could find them in, in English, or translated. And what I found was there were certain key uh, principles that were shared basically by everybody. <coughs> Everybody starts with the importance of accuracy, followed by the truth. Accuracy and the truth are not the same thing. You can accurately um, quote Donald Trump. Is it the truth? You have to check that out. Uh, the importance of, of um, correcting your mistakes transparently and quickly. Don't bury it halfway down the story. Don't take advantage of your position as a journalist to make money. Um, balance. 
um, objectivity. So everybody shares that. But what I found was that, you know, most of the ethics codes hadn't really kept up to date with, including ours, of course, had not kept up to date with with the with the new technology. So. Um, Okay, next. So when we published it, well, you can go back one. When we published it, we actually published it in um, English, French, Arabic, Spanish, and in um, collaboration with uh, JMC, we published it in Chinese as well. Um, so yeah, so this is a cultural thing out here. So yeah, no red envelopes with cash, please. I tell my students that. So graphic images, I've, I've, I've got to be fairly quickly. So the use of graphic images, why do you use a graphic image? And why do you use the picture of the falling man in 9-11? Um, my answer to that is you have to ask yourself, is it in the public interest? Does it meet the public's right to know, right to be informed? And I ask, ask my students quite often, should you use this photograph or not? The answer is always yes. Why? It's a terrible photograph, but it sh you have to know what the context is. It was 9-11, people were jumping out of the tower. So it was very important that people knew what was happening. I think the problem with the following man, which was an AP photograph, it's not a cr criticism of the photograph, is that people tried to put some sort of dignity into this, the position this man was in, where if you see the series, it's just somebody tumbling to their death. Um, so is it in the public interest to see this? Does it meet the public's right to know? Yes, you have to know what's happening. Do you want to see the photograph of when he hits the ground? No, serves no purpose. That's gore. We're not, we're not in the gore business. We're in the news business. This was a striking photograph in 2011. It was a bomb attack in Kabul. She's 12, the girl. And um, I remember when it came in to the desk and um, the... The, um, the question is, do you use this or not? Well, the answer was yes, because it's a child. We didn't know her age, but it's obviously a child. It goes back to, I think Hannah was saying, you know, the difficulties of, of getting permission. The rule with children is with minors, you should normally ask a guardian or a parent. You can't do in a situation like this. But the picture was so powerful and said so much about the conflict in Afghanistan that we ran it, and the photographer, who was an Afghan, this is not a, called Masood Husseini, who I know, um, he published it because he wanted the world to know what was going on in his own country, and we visited the family afterwards, and they were, she and her father were comfortable with the fact that this was, was shown. It, so, and despite the horror of the photograph, there were no dismembered limbs or headless bodies, so it doesn't fall into gore. And the expression on her face made it such an exceptional photograph. But use of graphic images is, is, a, is a constant daily issue. Responsibility to freelancers, um, and I've just written a piece about this actually for the Fulton Correspondence Club magazine, if you can get it online. But James Foley was working for us when he was kidnapped in Syria in 2012. And at that time we weren't sending um, international staff into Syria, but we were still taking content from international foreign freelancers who were going into Syria. And after James was kidnapped and two years later was, was killed by ISIS, we stopped um, using content from freelancers working in zones where we don't go ourselves. There was quite a lot of pushback from freelancers who said it's not up to AFP to decide where we work or what we do. My answer to that is, well, if it's too dangerous for AFP or AP or Reuters, it's too dangerous for you. You shouldn't be there, you know, and we're not going to encourage you to be there because we're go not going to pay you and, and have to edit a video of you two years down the line in an orange jumpsuit in the desert. And we signed up, and it was interesting. Earlier, we have a speaker from the Dart Center. Uh, we work in collaboration with the Dart Center, and I actually quote the Dart Center in the ethics um, document and a lot of major media including AFP signed this in the wake of James Foley's death this freelance journalist safety principles fundamentally you should treat freelancers the way you treat your own staff and and this is what we do we we we, we 
are, full, are sort of long term freelancers, <coughs> not just a one off stringer. Uh, <coughs> we give them hostile environment training and the same kind of insurance that we would for a staff member, full time member of staff. Um, should journalists help victims? Well, we, we discussed this at length, so I don't really need to, to go into it. I mean, Hannah, it was very interesting when she was talking about the helping the person who was crossing the river. But I mean, to me, the, the, I have one photograph which I think kind of answers it, and the answer is yes and yes, because um, this, he's called Aris Messinas. He's, he, work, he was covering the migrant crisis, and these were the migrant arrivals on the beach in a, an island called Lesbos. And yeah, he said, he wrote a very moving blog on the AFP blog, and he said, yeah, there's a baby in the water going to drown. Yes, you go in. And I mean, I think that it's, it's quite an elegant photograph because in one hand he's got, one arm he's got the child, the other arm he's got his, his camera. So, I mean, but Anna, I think she, 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 she was, she's, she's lived that. So she, she spoke quite eloquently about the, yes, and uh, as Patrick, I think, would as well. So yes, you, you're a human being. You're not a first responder. And you have, if, if you pick that child up, what do you do when you get to the beach? So, but you're a human being and yes, you do help. So as I say, these were kind of some of the new issues I was introducing in, in the ethics book. I'm, I'm gonna wrap this up fairly quickly. Another one was duty of care and minimizing harm. And when, I don't know if you all remember the Charlie Hebdo attacks in, in Paris. There was a video shot by a man called Jordi Mir who lived above the street where this happened. And these two brothers came out and they shot a policeman. They shot him once, and then he was lying on the ground, and they ran up and shot, up, shot him at point-blank range. It kind of comes back to graphic images. What do you do? It's important that the world sees that two gunmen with Kalashnikovs shot a policeman in the streets of Paris. The public's right to know the, our duty to inform. So how do you, what's your responsibility to the policeman? You have to show it but you have to respect his dignity. And I think there's a, a general consensus within the, the responsible mainstream media, you don't show point of death. You don't need to show the moment in the video when, the, when they fire point blank at his head. So the important thing was to show what happened in the context without going much further. For his family, very, very difficult, but I'm afraid the overwhelming importance of the news story meant that you had to publish images from it, but you minimize the harm. You, 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 you have a duty of care so you don't show the point of death. You can pixelate the body on the ground so he's not identifiable. Um, I'm, I'm getting to the end. Another one, after in the wake of the Me Too, Too movement, I mean, my responsibility was editorial. I was involved in a, a project last year which published its findings. I think this was in January or February. Um, the coverage of women in, in, in AFP and in the media in general. One interesting statistic came out is, uh, is that like 75% to 80% of analysts, experts quoted in stories are male. There's very, and there's quite a movement now and, and to, to encourage people to use women as experts and analysts. And, and for example, for the, the, the Korea summit with uh, Trump and Kim Jong Un, they actually there was a there was a very useful um, document published online by a, a women's group which listed all the female experts on the Korean issue. Um, use gender neutral uh, terms, say firefighter, not fireman, which is easier in English than it is in French because <laughs> um, you don't have to describe somebody's appearance unless it's relevant. If it's the queen, what she was wearing to an official event fine, but somebody testifying in court, no. So, you know, all this kind of stuff. So we, we a lot of this exists already in, in, in our style book and, and ethics, but we revisited this quite recently. And this, this is going into the new style book, which I also just finished, and it, in, into the ethics. And just to, to wrap up, um, um, trust in the media, uh, coming back to truth and inaccuracy, uh, we've developed uh, social media verification to a great extent. We speak a lot to Ian uh, Martin from Storyful, and we have a partnership with Facebook. And we now have, I don't know if you can read it, uh, it's called AFP Fact Check. So we, we fact checked 
um, stories that are flagged on, that we, we share a, a platform with Facebook, so stories come up that look dubious and we fact check it. And this was one we did on, on um, Judge Kavanaugh's home vandalized. This was actually a, a photograph from Canada from 2016, which went viral online today, uh, well, last week. Um, in 2018. So we're very involved in fact-checking as well. And I think it all comes back to ethics and, and um, accuracy, truth. So this is, this is basically the, the work we've, we're doing, and it's an ongoing, um, it's an ongoing project in AFP. Uh, there's things I would like to add to it, but an ethics document is not like a style book. You don't constantly update it as, as, as things come in and out of fashion. So that's it. If I'm on, I'm very active yeah. on Twitter. Um, I don't know how did I get back to where I was. So, as I say, if you follow me, I promise to follow you back. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Eric. Um, just um, thank you so much for this presentation. I I have one question uh, about uh, a, a code of ethics like this in a huge company like yours. Like, is there anything in place? that guarantees the observance of those rules? Yes, I mean, on a daily basis, we have a whole editorial structure, yeah. And people are told to read it, but we have an editorial structure. We, we um, every day the editor-in-chief publishes a, a, um, a roundup of uh, an analysis of the previous day's coverage, so it's monitored, yeah. And then uh, uh, one more thing, like yesterday uh, at the South China Morning Post, we were putting together a video seven days after the earthquake or in Sulawesi. And uh, every day we put out a video uh, and uh, all of a sudden there was kind of a, um, se several different editors found this footage on AFP, which was of certain children in Palu on the ground face down who um, now live in the park and people thought that these were very strong images which they were and uh, I was asked to work with some of the producers to put together a video uh, and um, basically to tell the story that more than 70,000 people are now homeless. Um, we did and uh, I just checked we had uh, 20,000 views on this video it's AFP footage um, but in the light of today's discussion, I have no idea if this was taken by a woman or a man, if there was any consent from the children, or if it was an Indonesian videographer or a French or a Dutch videographer. Like, how, how does that it wasn't kind of... was signed? There wasn't anything in there? Uh, I didn't see any... any it, it was clearly like a compilation of different people, some stuff looked like it could have been amateur footage. Um, but so how do you kind of uh, reflect? Does it matter what, who took the video? Well, we just had a long conversation that it's interesting to know if people uh, are local in, in, in terms of representation. So since that was not, that's not part of how it's communicated to the end user, which in, in our case is, is a newspaper. So. Um, uh, what's your opinion about that? I mean, that? We, we sent a, I mean, I don't know who took that video, but we sent a team from Jakarta, probably local journalists. What, I mean, covering children is a real issue, you know, because, I mean, the rule is you should get, um, for minors, you should get the consent from, from a, for, as I said, from a parent or a guardian, but in a disaster situation or in, in a bomb situation, it's, it's not practical. And I mean, this is the one thing about ethics. They're a bit um, loose around the edges. I mean, you're, at, you're, you're, you know, you have to say to yourself, you, at the end of the day, it's a judgment, and you say, you know, edit, can, is it in the public interest? Does it meet the duty to inform to show these children in this situation? Um, going back, I, I don't see the justification for the, the photograph of the, the well, I wouldn't call her a prostitute. She's a, she's a child being raped by a, a, a client. And I, I didn't see the justification for that. I think in a, in, a, in a disaster situation where it can help as well, I think it is justified. But coverage of children is a particularly difficult area. Yeah. OK, thank you. Jen, can we put up the... Uh, so so uh, what we aim to do in the coming 20 minutes is uh, to actually kind of 
go over some of the points that came out in the different debates and see if we can get to some practical solutions, some ideas that uh, amongst us we think could actually be executed or put in place. Um, and possibly maybe come up with some pilot projects. Um, this may not all be done in the coming uh, 20 minutes, but this will be uh, some of the results we, uh, we aim for uh, after, this, uh, after this day of, uh, of debates. So um, the first, I hope everybody can read this, but I'm, I'm just going to pass on the mic to uh, David, I guess, because the first bunch of these questions came out of your uh, panel discussion. So maybe just talk about it. Yes, yeah, so I had the uh, unenviable task of trying to distill some common points out of you know what was a really fantastic but wide-ranging discussion. So I just put together three clusters of questions for us uh, to think about. Um, and the first is, uh, I took up uh, Philippe's point that uh, he said that we used to have more filters and that therefore, but in a changing environment, you know, that was, uh, had been reduced. And I wondered whether we should ask the question whether the new media landscape requires, uh, it should be new filters, codes, and standards. Is there something distinctive about this period? You know, I mean, like you, I've been, I was on a team in 2016 to put together the first code of ethics for the contest at the World Press Photo Foundation. It hadn't had one previously. We reviewed all those codes and so on. It's a very, very tricky business to think about how you summarize that. And I also think about, which is kind of linked to the second one, is really the limitation of codes, because it seems like an incredibly obvious thing to say, but codes codify. That means they sum, uh, summarize and synthesize attitudes and the way you should approach certain things into statements that indicate to people the direction they should go, the, the, the mode of behavior they should adopt, and so on. But codes don't provide kind of legislative power to determine that you're going to achieve this outcome if, if you do this. So the, the second point, the second question is, you know, how many of the issues that we're facing in terms of ethics, particularly around the ethics of representation, I'm particularly thinking of some of the points that Tanvi made on the, on the panel this morning, how many require actually a different way of thinking, decolonization of the mind, et cetera, as opposed to formal written standards? And if it requires a new way of thinking, that's a, a, a critical process. Um, that's an ongoing process. That's a constant questioning, a constant finding of the limits, and a constant evaluation. Um, so the code in that sense might just be the beginning of the process. It might just codify some of those things. And then we raise interesting questions about how much does the context of the image, the purpose of the image, and the identity of a photographer affect the ethical questions that, that you might ask. Not that in any sense is it entirely context dependent or dependent on, on those things, but we've we heard um, we had Arti use the word purpose a lot in the in the third panel. We touched on that in the first as well, and I think purpose or function, they're really one of the fundamental questions about images. You know, what's the purpose of the image that you're making? What are you trying to do with it? What story are you trying to tell? And there are different um, well, different different calculations come into play. You can you approach them with the same sort of process of critical questioning. You approach them with the same sort of ethical considerations, but there might be different calculations in different moments that uh, could lead to slightly different outcomes. And you have to think about about that sort of possibility. Yeah, thank you. I think the, all those are, are very important questions. Um, I had one question, uh, particularly for you, since you are uh, in the business of awarding um, good work out there. Not personally, uh, but yes. <laughs> um, how could ethical considerations in our profession be rewarded? Because somehow, if you get to a point where something is kind of not okay, you decide not to do it, like you can never get rewarded for that. Like, well, is this a discussion that's going on in World Press Photo? And is there some way how we could come to a point that people are rewarded for their choices? Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a really good question. I mean, 
kind of two responses to that. I mean, I joked that I'm not personally in the business, but it is kind of an important point that it's one of the most difficult things we kind of struggle with as an organization sometimes is, you know, we're a foundation, we have a series of programs, and the photo contest is, you know, one of the best known programs. We appoint a jury and then the jury decides and as a staff member, I don't have a vote on that jury. The director of the foundation doesn't have a vote on that jury. We can't participate in the discussions in the jury room. We can sit in the jury room and listen to them, but we can't participate. Now, we have a, that's why we have a code of ethics, that way, why we have particular rules. Uh, starting this year, we made a statement on representation to the jury, addressing some of precisely the issues that we've talked about today, because we felt that actually a lot of those things about consent and dignity and avoiding stereotypes and so on are very difficult to put into a code of ethics and the value of stating, you know, you shall not have stereotypes when the jury is going to interpret things in different ways. It's not going to be a, an enforceable statement in a code of ethics, but we, so as a foundation, we make that statement to the jury and say, here are a set of questions that we as a foundation want you, the jury, to think about because they're very important to us. I can't make, or any of us can't make the juries uh, follow through all the time or in the way or whatever, but it raises those questions. And then there's the verification process, which has about four steps in it. So that's kind of, there's a kind of a complex of things going on now in terms of uh, bringing these ethical considerations to that judging process. But your question is, could you reward actually certain decisions and so on. Well, you hope that if the jury pays attention to the statement of representation and so on, they would be doing that. Um, but a lot of, you have to be honest and say that a lot of those considerations that we've talked about in terms of consent, you have to go to the photographer directly to ask those questions um, about how the photo was made. And that is something that just happens once a jury has made a decision. There's now a longer period of time in which more verification and fact checking takes place. And I was involved earlier this year in with one, one series that had been awarded that involved women was we went back to that photographer and said, you know, these were portraits. Um, do you have model releases for these? Mm. A and we asked the photographer to provide those sorts of things. So there's, there's more and more checking of those. I mean, we are looking, at, we're constantly talking about these issues, debating these issues in, in a variety of fora internally. So we are looking to reward different ways of storytelling, particularly around focusing on solutions, for example. But it, mm. a very interesting question. Could you, could you actually reward certain ethical choices? Mm. Yeah. Something to think about. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Anahita, the next points are from, uh, that came out of your debate. Could you please um, deliver it, elaborate? I should have done what David so cleverly did, is ask counter questions, <laughs> instead of which I took the brief <laughs> find actionable points, solutions very seriously, and, um, but... Uh, Which is what we're after, so that <laughs> that's good. Yeah. But, uh, so I have very, almost too practical, perhaps, uh, suggestions coming from the discussions earlier. Um, one was I found it interesting, also how Patrick talked about seeking consent. That is not a one-shot thing. You don't just go and say, can I, and the person nods, or... You don't say, I really, really want your photograph, can I get it? But you say that it doesn't make a difference to me whether you give consent or I have other options where you try to minimize the pressure on the person and ask it in multiple ways. I think that was really interesting. Um, on the um, ethics of selection, of course, a very, very uh, complex issue, but I think uh, the phrase, uh, is it in the public interest? which I just used mm -hmm. is a uh, very good uh, load star for all of us doing journalism. Now, not everything you do as a journalist may be furthering public interest. I mean, you could be doing entertainment, for example, as uh, entertainment-related journalism as a career. Um, but uh, I think uh, in that case, uh, also, you, c you can test whether anything that you're doing is uh, um, are you, are you doing it in the best possible way? And I think the do no harm principle cuts across a lot of what you're doing. You could be doing harm by uh, picking entertainment in a certain way, which doesn't really serve the purpose, or you could be uh, doing harm in the way you're reporting in conflict situations. So uh, 
am I doing this in the best way possible is something also these are questions I think which can be asked. Um, uh, in the, I think uh, the do your homework uh, was another extremely important point which came out, uh, which I think cuts across a lot of these issues. And uh, it's about context and in the world of speed and volume of journalism, it, uh, it's very easy not to do the homework. And a lot of us have worked or work in newsrooms where you're not really asked to do any homework. You're just sent out on one assignment in the morning, another in the evening. You're covering maybe 100 different topics over a period of a few months. But uh, so this is something which I think has to be self-disciplined insofar as possible. Learn something, anything, five minutes if you have time or five days or five months uh, to find out a little more about where you're uh, going. Um, I was the, was the security, security person? Yeah. So I think, of course, in terms of the security of the person being photographed, this is something which, uh, as was even being discussed in the last panel, that this is perhaps something which uh, you have to think, uh, not just ask the person, but you have to proactively think through situations which they may not be able to imagine. Either you might change their name, you blur their faces. And again, it, it could be something which, again, I'm not sure how one would implement it, but. This could be a potentially a pilot project to see whether you can have a concept of continuing consent, how that might uh, work in situations. And if I can add one uh, more uh, thing, which is underlying all of these issues, perhaps, is the diversity in uh, newsrooms, which I think is extremely important. Uh, so I, I mean, the AFP is talking about uh, covering women in a different way. I would say that also begins in the newsrooms. Uh, to, the more representation you have in not just your freelancers, loc uh, local reporters, editors, but in managerial positions, I think yeah. that really shifts the entire discourse. Thank you. Thank you. I, th I think each of these points are very important. Just one. Oh, sorry. Hello. I would just add that the global news director in Paris is a woman, Michelle Lerido. Good. So. <laughs> <laughs> first good time. <laughs> okay, first time. Good. Um, uh, Anahita, I, I just have one follow-up question. Uh, this homework, could that homework in some way or another include like homework about ethics? Like, w and if so, like what would somebody going into the field, what, what, where could they go if they want to do their ethics homework? Um, again, I think this is something others have been saying. There is law, there is code, there's ethics, and there's a personal moral compass. So there are some things which you know you can't do. For example, there's a defamation law. Uh, there are things which your organization, if you're working with an organization which is large and has these issues in mind, uh, the organization tells you what to do and what not to do. But as I think was again being said in the earlier panels, probably the best touchstone of this is your own peer community. A um, lot of the issues are not uh, are not new, but I mean the challenges come in different forms. So there's probably nothing that has been discussed here that has not been thought about, worked through by people who've been working for a long time. So and I think. Uh, Perhaps there could be a way of making this more accessible. Potentially, that's something of a project. Um, and I think Ivan was talking also about where, how do you take all of this great discussion and information and make it available to a wider public. Yeah. So uh, we journalists are notoriously shy about writing about ourselves. Yeah. And I think maybe that's something which could change. Uh, there are platforms where journalism is being discussed. Right now, in very rarefied way within a certain very subsect of a subsect, mainly academics, perhaps, or events like this. But there is a way of making it more conversational. And I think we should look for opportunities. We, for example, our, our magazine has is doing some of that. And we would be very happy to do more. That's great. So Robert, I have one important question for you. Like you, you are in many ways uh, the instigator of this day. Um, 
you've organized a lot. Like, can you please share with us what you hope could come out of a day like this? Like, what's in your wildest dream? Like, what 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 would make you really happy? Oh, what would make me really happy? Um, this is an interesting <laughs> question. <laughs> I hadn't really thought about that. Um, I think I think there is. There are some things that we can do, and that they've been touched on um, today, that would actually begin to address some of the the sort of the worst offenders. Yeah, and it's not about calling people out necessarily. It's about supporting them. Yeah, it's about supporting young photographers. It's about supporting people in the field with solutions. Yeah, and I think we can actually borrow from other industries in order to do that. For example, informed consent working with children. There's a lot of good practice out there, standards which have been used for like decades. And I think to bring some of that in, package it in a way that someone who's out there can reference it. And what I'm always very mindful about is that photographers are working under often very difficult circumstances, having to make uh, decisions on their own in a short space of time. And so whatever you provide them with has to be a tool that facilitates them to do a better job rather than, I think we we're saying, you know, rather than dictate some sort of moral code. Yeah, It's about helping them produce something which uh, produces better work, protects them, but also protects the people that they're working with, whether you want to call them a subject or a collaborator. Yeah? So I would ideally like to see some, some projects which look about providing those tools. Yeah? Uh, particularly, I think one of the things that w it was touched on was with the changing media economy. The support that's available, particularly for freelancers, who would have maybe done a, almost like an apprenticeship within an agency before, isn't there. Yeah? Um, and so providing something for them, you're asking sort of where do you get your sort of your, your ethics 101. Yeah? Um, providing something for them which is useful, I think, is key. And, and it's very doable. I don't think that's a difficult thing. Yeah? I was talking to Matt, who I can't see where he is, at the back. And and, and we both work in human rights. Uh, I know that Amnesty International has a particular code uh, in regards to informed consent for interviewing uh, victims of human rights violations. There's a lot of work that you know could be done to adapt that uh, to being something practical uh, for photographers, working with photographers to make sure that it is something useful for them. Um, so that would be one thing. Um, mm. There's a whole load of other things I think we've touched on, which yeah. are more sort of sort of long term slower sort of changes that's a bit more dis difficult to prescribe uh, a sort of a remedy to. Okay, so we're really running out of time. Is there someone in the uh, public that has something to add? Oh. <laughs> Arty. Um, really quickly, I, I like the idea of um, ethics, ethical um, standards and behavior being rewarded. I also hear that codes, given that ethics in, in this field is complex, it means it's never static. It's a dynamic thing. So, I mean, how about like an idea of having a kind of committee? Because right now all the codes are internal within the agencies. But how about having something like an ethics panel made up of inter-organizational you know, representatives you know, such as yourselves or something, and having like an annual, I don't know, a reward or an annual statement or an annual photograph that encapsulates one ethical issue and it's dynamic because it will take into consideration the changing context of the world and technology. So, so something that's living rather than static. That's just an idea. Someone wants to react to that? I want to react, but in a slightly different way. Um, I'll, I'll, this is from what Robert said, it's that it's not about uh, calling out and shaming people. Uh, maybe this is going to be a wildly unpopular idea, but I really feel that some amount of naming and shaming is important because th at this point in time, you can earn guts and glory by doing good journalism, but there is absolutely almost no cost or consequence to doing a lot of bad journalism. Mm. And um, I think uh, the, maybe Tanvi will agree with me. Indian journalism mainstream is a shame 
just how wildly inaccurate it is and there is no cost. So I would very much welcome something which calls out people as okay. a way of history. Okay, so this is going to be, Michelle, I think uh, you're the last question. Um, so I, ha I guess this is more for uh, David and Eric. Um, I think, you know, given that we're participating in, in I think we're all aware of the problems in the industry. Um, and we know that, at least for contests like World Press Photo, by and large, through self-selection, it's free to apply, yeah. right? Um, but by and large, m men, Western men apply more than any other category of photographers, right? And with AFP and with other uh, wires as well, the field is, is male-dominated, right? Um, so if we know these things, or what, what kind of actions are you guys taking in your institutions to kind of counter that uh, in terms of reaching out and outreach as well as kind of changing the, the internal structures of your, of your organization? Yeah, you, you're spot on. I mean, we did the analysis <coughs> of the entry statistics, you know, in 2016. We looked back and, yeah, it's consistently been 85% male, 15% female, um, which is a, a wild imbalance. <clears throat> so there's lots of outreach is one thing. Um, reaching out to associations, organizations, cooperatives, etc. Encouraging people to enter, emphasizing that that it's it's open, it's free to enter around the world. It's judged anonymously, you know, so the jury does not see the name of the photographer, the agency, the publication, um, so on and so forth. So it's, it's getting people over that. Uh, that barrier to to entry for a lot of that. We have initiatives like the six by six program, which is to surface talent in different regions, not a contest, but but to highlight that. We have the African Photojournalism Database, which is re reaching out to a particular region, and we're very happy with the way that's actually producing real work for individuals on that, as well as new exhibitions and highlighting those issues and so on. So outreach to those communities and emphasizing the, the importance to us of, of that diversity. It's going to be a long process <laughs> um, because the contest is 60 years old. It has that heritage. It's associated with general news and hard news. It's always had other categories, um, but those general news and hard news photographers are predominantly male. And so we have to reach out to the uh, other photographers to enter in other categories. And, and also, it's up to us to, to put in other categories that recognize other forms of storytelling right. so for that. The, so the and just yeah. Correct. Just very quickly on AFP, um, not quite on your level, David, but we have what we call the Kate Webb Prize, named after Kate Webb, who was a very famous, um, legendary uh, women uh, war correspondent, worked for UPI and then AFP. And so we just announced the Kate Webb Prize for this year. Um, we started it. She died when I was regional director in Hong Kong, so we started the prize. It's for local Asian journalists um, to reward courageous reporting. And I don't have the numbers in my head. I think it's probably been on the go maybe eight, nine years, something like that now. I would say, you know, don't Hit me back if I'm wrong. I would say about 50% of the win I think it's been, on, on the winners, it's been about 50-50 between win women and men. So I would say, yeah. Great. Mm. Great. yeah. I just also wanted to emphasize one more point, um, which is that we now have a diversity mandate for how the jury is put together, for how um, participants in the masterclass are put together and so on. So we're using our division of the world into, into six regions. And the mandate is that it cannot be less than 50% female mm -hmm. on jury and participants, and there have to be representatives, uh, equal number of representatives from all those regions. So we're hoping that over time, when that's recognized too, people will say, well, you know, there's the opportunity that someone like me will be judging, or, you know, someone, someone like, the, I mean, the me is the person entering, um, just to emphasize the, the openness of that. That's great. So yeah, and just um, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, I, I, I think uh, World Press should keep its open its eyes open here in Hong Kong because uh, at the journalism uh, um, schools here, um, most are women. Most students are women. So I think that's uh, that's really good news. And uh, I think we should round this off with the idea that uh, it would be really great to maybe see a ethical category in the world press photo.
<laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. This is, yeah, yeah. Not my decision to make a loan, of course. So once the video gets back to the office, I'll be like, what did you promise? What did you, what did you agree to do? But no, I mean, I think the question of how to, how to reward, that may or may not be in the contest. And that's one of the things is actually we don't want to be defined just by the contest. We want to have other programs and projects. So maybe there's a way of doing it. But, but how to reward and highlight that sort of thing, again, while avoiding the idea of the term best practice. Yeah. That's what we're pointing towards. Okay. Yeah. I saw Sorry? Here you go. Yeah, that's a good idea. So let's uh, let's I'm let's defer take that to my boss who's not in town. So, I'll, but I will take that up with him. <laughs> that's cool. Okay. So one more time, uh, thank you so much, World Press Photo, Rights Exposure, all the panelists, HKU, and uh, everybody here in the crowd. Thank you for coming, and um, have a good evening. Yeah.